All right, welcome to uh, the Asia Pacific panel. Thank you for coming. I know it's a, uh, it's a horrible time of the day uh, <laughs> in terms of commute and St. Patrick's and the combination of both. Uh, but we're happy for you to be here, and uh, I am blessed by having uh, two great experts on the Asia Pacific, Dr. Xiaoyu um, Pu and Dr. Sean O'Neill. And uh, we'll start by, well, I'm going to ask them to uh, introduce themselves and to talk about their areas of expertise. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Sean O'Neill, and uh, I, I was telling my colleagues here, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a pseudo-academic uh, because I'm only a visiting professor uh, at GW for this year. Uh, my day job is as a Foreign Service Officer, and it has been for over 20 years now. Uh, I'm a career member of the Senior Foreign Service, and what that means is I have an exceptionally short attention span. <laughs> I change <laughs> jobs every two or three years. I've served in about eight countries entirely in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, most recently as Consul General, American Consul General in Chiang Mai, Thailand, in northern Thailand, uh, but also in, in, you know, countries as far west as Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and then Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, Thailand, and, and Burma. Um, the reason I'm here is, 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 of course, because of Chairman Ed Royce. Um, and I'd like to just take a moment, first of all, to thank Alexi and to thank uh, Xiaoyu for, for joining me on this panel. Uh, thank Owen Holmes uh, for, for helping to organize this and all, all your work. Um, Tom Sheehy, who was my boss uh, on, on the committee, and, and Ed Royce, uh, who I learned a lot from Tom and Ed, Ed Royce, uh, Chairman Royce, um, while I was a Foreign Affairs Fellow on uh, Capitol Hill working for Chairman Royce's committee. And this was a program where the State Department detailed me over. And five days before I was supposed to go back to the State Department after my supposedly one year tour there, uh, Chairman Royce and Tom came to me and said, hey, what, what, are you, what are you doing for the next year? And I said, well, I'm supposed to be at my next assignment in five days. <laughs> I, don't, I think I'm busy. They're like, no, 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 you're not. That's fine. We'll, <laughs> we'll make a call. Um, but I, I did. I learned, you know, uh, quite a bit, and, and this ties into what I'd like to talk about, what I'll, what I'll talk about today is, is, you know, I think what I learned both in the practice of diplomacy but then in my time on the Hill working for Chairman Royce and Tom was not, was that, it, it's not enough to just have a good idea. It's not enough to just think about policy and what you want. You have to turn that into reality. You have to understand the mechanisms that turn it into reality, whether it's in Congress or out in the field. And that's something that I learned on Capitol Hill and something I hope I've learned and applied uh, in my 21 years in the Foreign Service. And that's uh, what I will try to contribute today's, uh, to today's discussion. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Xiao Yupu. I'm a policy professor at the University of Nevada, Reno. It's my great pleasure and honor to join the discussion. My expertise, including international politics, international relations, especially US-China relations, uh, but I'm also a very optimistic person. So look at the topic and my, my attitude. There's uh, contradictory, right? So nowadays talking about US-China relations, how could anybody be optimistic? So unlike Sean, who is a real diplomat, and uh, Mr. Royce, who is a very influential political leader in US Congress, I'm just a professor of academia. I have zero uh, real policy influence. My way to uh, maintain optimistic view is to lower my expectations, not really change the world. How could I lower my expectations? So my professor told me that international politics, there are three options. Bad, worse, catastrophe. So <laughs> our, my job is try to provide some proposal to avoid catastrophe and seek uh, maintain a bad outcome. So I think I, I can do that. <laughs> okay, uh, since we talk about uh, Thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> since we talk about pessimists and optimists, uh, allow me to remind you about a sad joke from circa 1969 Moscow at the time of a, <laughs> of a uh, Sino-Soviet border clashes, right? And the joke asks for the differences between optimists and pessimists and pragmatists. And the answer is uh, optimists study English, 
pessimists study Chinese, <laughs> and pragmatists study how to use Kalashnikov guns. <laughs> All right, but that's just a dark humor from, from another war, from 1969. Uh, we're going to focus on uh, Indochina, I'm sorry, in the Indo-Pacific region. You know, we, we will eventually, of course, uh, talk about China. I have a long list of questions. I uh, will run for about 40-some minutes, and then I'm going to open the floor to exchange for the audience. Uh, but before we start, before the first uh, question, and maybe kind of building on this um, story of um, optimism versus pessimism, we tend to summon uh, the spirit of President Nixon today, right, on a number of occasions. But let me emphasize the, uh, sort of the uh, another aspect of President Nixon uh, diplomacy, which is incredible pragmatism, right? Uh, belief that efficient diplomacy can substitute for the lack of or decline of material power, right? So this sort of spirit of real, real politic and pragmatism, I think, is something that we should keep in mind when we address a lot of those issues. Nixon is the person who, you know, at the time of his visit of China in 1972, when he scribbles his notes, preparing to meet with Mao Zedong, right? He writes, treat him as an emperor, show deference, <laughs> right? Um, he is willing to uh, raise toasts with Mao Tai with the perpetrators of Cultural Revolution. Right? If you look at this footage, it's just remarkable. He recites uh, Chairman Mao's poetry during his uh, visit, right? So uh, just, you know, just an illustration of how flexible and pragmatic uh, the pursuit of efficient diplomacy can be, right? And remember, this is early 1970s, this, this opening up relations with China, an attempt to, to play strategic triangle. This is the time when American relative power is in decline after defeat in Vietnam or the coming defeat in Vietnam. This is the time when the Soviet Union, the biggest rival at the time, right, uh, is popping champagne and celebrating victory. We won. Right. Uh, and look what they, you know, what they managed to do, Nixon, Kissinger, through efficient diplomacy, by playing the strategic triangle using relationship with China as a leverage against the Soviet Union. Um, so just something, you know, something which probably might be uh, a good inspiration uh, for some of our discussions. Uh, but let me start with the uh, general question about the Indo-Pacific. Um, Diplomacy, right, or, or uh, American strategy towards Indo Pacific. First of all, um, does the strategy exist? That's the first question. Is it coherent enough? Uh, secondly, um, what are the major recent changes in this policy or strategy? How do those changes influence the uh, practice of diplomacy, American diplomacy in the region? So big changes, recent changes, how do they uh, influence diplomacy, and the record of successes and, what's the polite word, um, failures in Indo-Pacific. Can we start with? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, look, yes. uh, well, first of all, I mean, if I, if I say the strategy doesn't exist, they're going to stop paying me on Monday. <laughs> so, um, the strategy most certainly does exist. I think, uh, you know, uh, the follow-on question is obviously how effective is it, how well-tailored is it to the challenges that we face in the world. I think that's an open question, and it's one that, that this administration and every administration and Congress should continually examine because, you know, the world changes, obviously. It always has. Uh, it changes maybe more quickly uh, or, or more asymmetrically now than ever before. And so the idea that you can write a strategy on a piece of paper or many pieces of paper and have that be static for four or five or six years is is not very realistic, I think. But yes, the strategy does exist, right? It's, it's uh, this administration is articulated, it is advancing freedom, building connections, driving prosperity, bolstering security, building uh, resilience to threats, um, which is, you know, fairly broad enough, I think, that you can be fairly flexible in response to, to changes. Um, it definitely has, in my view as a practitioner, changed the practice of diplomacy and we're seeing some of those changes now in how the State Department and how the interagency um, operates throughout the Indo-Pacific and in response to China's uh, global ambitions, uh, or the PRC, I should say, the PRC's global ambitions. Um, we can see that in some concrete ways. 
Uh, in December, the State Department uh, announced the launch of uh, what they're colloquially calling the China House, uh, which is a major reorganization of how the United States approaches uh, the PRC uh, and the issues raised by PRC's uh, ambitions around the world. Rather than having a bilateral China desk that deals with bilateral relations, which is the traditional model that we've had for, for many years, there's now a China House, which attempts to bring under one roof an interagency team that covers both bilateral relations, multilateral relations, economics, security, technology, sort of all of the different issues, both <coughs> geographic and functional, uh, that are impacted uh, by, uh, by the PRC and, and by our uh, uh, Indo-Pacific strategy and Indo-Pacific uh, uh, objectives and, and, and interests. Um, and, you know, I, I would hope, I would just, I'll just end by saying, I would hope that the U.S. government, both the political, the, the policy makers, as well as the practitioners like myself who carry out policy, never just kind of keep that strategy on the shelf and refer to it the way we used to refer to encyclopedias and you were doing your papers, right? Um, you know, when I grew up and when I went to high school and college, I'm probably in the last generation. We didn't have the internet. I was the last generation before that was a thing where you Googled everything. And you would open up an encyclopedia, and that encyclopedia, depending on when your parents bought it, it could be, you know, one year old or eight years old. And, you know, it's, it's close enough, right? Close enough isn't good enough these days, right? And I think this strategy, uh, we need to remain focused on its objectives, and its objectives, as I said, are, are things like freedom, prosperity, promoting our brand of toothpaste, which is freedom and prosperity and free choice, uh, as opposed to the more autocratic brand of toothpaste um, that you see out there. Um, but I, I would hope that we continue to, to flex and change with the times, not just in our specific policies, but in how we carry them out. And the China House, I think, is one example of, of us doing that. All right. Okay. So regarding uh, uh, U.S. strategy, I think, uh, the United States has always played a leading role in the Indo-Pacific or Asia-Pacific region since World War II. Initially, the U.S. role is both in the security domain and in economic domain. But in recent two or three decades, China's economic in influence has increased in the region. Now we see, I think, in a sense that a lot of countries in, in this region, they rely upon the United States to provide security. But Increasingly, most of the countries in the region, China is their number one trading partner. I think, I think from, from U.S. side, the key challenge is overemphasize military security, but not emphasizing enough. At least, uh, I mean, from an academic perspective, we see the region in terms of U.S. diplomacy, economic diplomacy is not enough re regarding sort of uh, maintaining U.S. influence in the region. Finally, I think. Uh, uh, since the end, the earth, immediate after the end of the Cold War, a lot of leading international relations experts, they predict that there, we will see big conflicts in the region. But in contrast, 30 years later, we see the big conflict in Europe. But still, despite all the tension over Taiwan, South China Sea, the region still, we haven't seen like a direct interstate conflict, interstate war. So I think to some degree, both U.S. and China and regional countries, um, I mean, people can find all kinds of problems of specific policy, but uh, to some degree, there are important positive les lessons in the region. I think people need to reflect rather than only see the sort of uh, problem in this region. Yeah. Cool. Uh, let me just follow up uh, with a question about the pivot. Are we delivering on pivot to Asia Pacific? Something which uh, <laughs> Obama talked about, but it was yeah. more of a rhetorical thing, right? Uh, are we finally doing it or, or it's still sort of a more of a <laughs> figment of imagination? Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I think about this a lot and I, I think sometimes we think of it as, is, you know, is the U.S. government leading the pivot, or are the agencies of the U.S. government effectively pivoting to Asia? I think to some sense, I mean, the pivot is a reflection of what private industry and citizens were already focusing on many years ago. I mean, I think that, um, you know, in the 80s and 90s, people were, you know, businesses and industries were obviously shifting and trading more. 
uh, throughout the Indo-Pacific. I think citizens were looking at it, uh, diaspora communities in the United States, diverse diaspora communities certainly were focused on it. I know Chairman Royce um, you know, has been focused on, on the Indo-Pacific region uh, for the entirety of his time in, in Congress. So to some extent, the, the articulation of the pivot is more, I think, a reflection of what was already happening. Um, so in terms of whether the U.S. government is delivering on that, I think gets back to the first question, which is, you know, are we allocating the resources and the time in the way it needs to be allocated to meet these challenges in the Indo-Pacific? And I would say, hopefully we are. I mean, and this will be me just speaking as, 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 as a citizen. Um, probably the way you deliver on that is to not think of it exclusively as a geographic region. In other words, we are, it's not like we're gonna divide our resources 20% to Europe, 30% to Asia, 10% to Africa, you know. You can't think of it that way. I don't think you ever should have thought of it that way maybe, but we certainly can't think of it that way now. And to the extent we are thinking of this more in terms of global objectives of promoting our interests or promoting our values uh, around the world, um, we will be engaging in the pivot because the pivot is really another way of recognizing that like the Indo-Pacific is really, really important. And it's gonna be really, really important for a long, long time. And if and we neglect it to our peril if we want to achieve these other objectives. Um, but but I'm still paid by the government, so let's hear from someone <laughs> who can tell you what they really think. <laughs> no, more specifically, I'm asking about initiatives such as, I don't know, what it was called, um, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Right. Sounds great, but once you look at it, it's yeah. a piece of paper uh, because there's no trade liberalization or anything. And, I, and it sounds like a great initiative, but, but again, coming back, coming back to your point, it's, sort of, uh, it's not really impressive compared to, to what China is trying to achieve. Mm. But, but let, me, let me clarify here. I think on the one hand, on the one hand, there are important limitations what the U.S. government can do in terms of promoting yeah. economic diplomacy because, I mean, U.S. government is sort of divided, de democracy. But on the other hand, I think we don't need to overestimate it, uh, the, the weakness of the U.S. side because the, the, the greatest strength of America is the society, is people, is business, business, private sector, university, soft power. So that's, that means despite, on the one hand, China can promote economic package in Southeast Asia, but if you, we evaluate in a more comprehensive way in the region, right? So US power, including soft power, is not necessarily declining because along all these like uh, private sectors, business, universities, decades of involvement in, in the region. I'm not downplay the role of government, right. but I, I, I want to sort of, given the, the difference between US and China, we, we, we should yeah. put that into perspective. No, and I mean, I agree. Having been in government for over mm. 20 years now, I mean, we do some things well, and we mm. do other things not so well. And I think that you know, the, the private sector is much better at allocating resources. It's much better at figuring out where these things should go and how to pivot and how to, how to be flexible. And that is the, mm. absolutely the strength of the American free market system. It has been for a long time. And I think to the extent we, in government, facilitate that, allow that free market entrepreneurialism, mm. right, and flexibility to flourish, we are doing our jobs to the extent we try to supplant it and, and decide how we're going to you know, divide up the resources on behalf of the private sector, uh, it's not going to work. And I think as a diplomat, I see my role, um, and, and we heard about uh, in the question and answer session with, uh, with Chairman Royce, you know, the expansion, this, this goal of expanding economic diplomacy and trade diplomacy. I would hope that that is geared towards creating level playing fields, opening markets, and then allowing American businesses to go in there as opposed to mm -hmm. negotiating on behalf of the United States and its economy and its trade mm -hmm. um, as diplomats, because we're just not that good at that, frankly. We're, we're good at the other stuff. We're not good at, the, at, 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 at that. All right, let me move to uh, China. Um, the prevailing wisdom seems to be here, at least in analysis in this country, is that uh, China used to practice something that was close to the idea of peaceful rise, peaceful rise of China, and diplomacy for a while 
since late 1990s, probably until 2008, 2009 or so. Financial crisis usually is used as a, as a benchmark here. Uh, and then China dropped peaceful rise and uh, went into the direction of uh, whatever you call it, war. Uh, what is the name? Wolf, Wolf, Wolf Warrior. Wolf Warrior. <laughs> Wolf Warrior. Right. If you haven't watched the movie, uh, I don't recommend. But in any, any case, um, so uh, yes, Wolf Warrior diplomacy. Um, first, my first question is: This really the case, or is it just simplification of something more complex? The second question: uh, If this is the case, if peaceful rise is sacrificed or was sacrificed, uh, why? It seemed to serve China so, so well. The idea that we're gonna rise peacefully, we're gonna be a constructive power, win-win uh, situation for everyone, China's a source of opportunity. So what happened? Well, first of all, is, it, is, it, is this a true sort of representational uh, situation, peaceful rise, over? Okay, so let Please. me, uh, yeah, your question is about the, like China's recent uh, foreign policy, Yep. generate a lot of anxiety, uh, criticism, pushback. So uh, scholars, uh, news media conceptualize either as China's so-called assertiveness, assertive diplomacy, or some people nowadays talking about wolf warrior diplomacy, all, all these. I think uh, we can put uh, into sort of broader perspective. Number one, um, I don't think China's peaceful rise strategy has ended. Despite, I think I got all the criticism, uh, uh, I, I sort of, uh, I, I think all these criticism to some degree are legitimate and reasonable concerns. But on the other hand, I mean, why people think about China's peaceful rise has ended? I don't think it's ended. I mean, at least, remember, my expectation is very low compared with Putin. I mean, China, <laughs> even Xi Jinping still, I mean, practice to some degree a peaceful rise of strategy. I mean, despite, again, all these tensions over Taiwan, South China Sea, China has not fight another con military conflict with labor countries for many decades. Actually, all the news focus on like uh, South China Sea, Taiwan. People might not might know China has settled territory disputes with most of its neighboring country in the past three decades peacefully. So I, I think, that's, I think, we need to put into perspective. But on the other hand, I think uh, China's foreign policy is becoming more assertive. Uh, that generated anxiety, of course, as in different parts of the world. I think there are several reasons. I would think, uh, number one is um, China's power has grown. So different from 1980s, 1990s, China is, economic-wise, it's a global power. So it's even if China wants to hide, it cannot be uh, hide itself anymore on the global stage. So to some degree, I largely characterize China's assertiveness in maybe into different tech categories. Some is more like a more assertiveness uh, is about like unresolved dispute uh, that may be related to Taiwan, South China Sea. Other assertiveness sometimes even could be positive. In, in, in the old day, China is always hiding, like in, a, I mean, Deng Xiaoping emphasized low profile. But uh, nowadays, Xi Jinping's foreign policy is more active. So this kind of assertiveness is not always bad. Uh, think about uh, uh, if, if uh, like global climate change, right? If we want to deal with global climate change, we want China to play a more active role. Otherwise, we cannot deal with this problem. Uh, think about North Korea nuclear weapons. Uh, other uh, issues. I mean, to some degree, we need to uh, maybe differentiate different ty types of more active Chinese uh, uh, foreign policy role. So maybe put into sort of more nuanced context. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think when we speak about China's rise, uh, I think there are a few. It pays to, to to think of it in a couple of different ways. I mean, first of all, to the extent we're talking about the rise of China relative to the United States. I mean, we should not necessarily be concerned about China becoming a more assertive or, or powerful country uh, in and of itself. I think what 
you know, because that's not a zero-sum competition. Um, what is a zero-sum competition is the very, very different values that, that we promote uh, and the interests we have around the world and those of the Chinese Communist Party. I think that is a zero-sum difference and that is a competition. And so, you know, it is not a problem, in my view, for the United States or our partners or allies around the world, you know, for China to be more engaged in trade, obviously, to be, China to be more engaged potentially in, in, uh, in diplomacy, in multilateral diplomacy, that can be tremendously helpful. Mm -hmm. But to the extent they are doing so um, on the basis of the CCP's uh, very authoritarian approaches, uh, both domestically and around the world, and, and in many cases, coercive approaches, as, as Chairman Royce uh, discussed, um, that is a problem, that is a concern. Um, and that, I think, is where uh, the U.S., under multiple administrations now, has made clear that, that we are going to stand up for our values. And uh, we do not, you know, look, when I was Consul General in Chiang Mai, mm -hmm. people used to ask us all the time, they'd come up to me and say, you know, Sean, are we, uh, so, you know, tell us why we should choose Thai citizens and, and officials come up and say, tell us why we should choose the United States over China. Mm -hmm. Why should we choose America over China? And I'd say, that's not, that's not a choice we're asking you to make. We're not asking anyone to choose the United States over China, but we want everyone to have a choice, right? And we don't think it's mutually exclusive. You can trade with us and trade with China, fine, but we don't want you to be coerced into only doing business with one partner or one country. And so, um, you know, when I hear the peaceful rise of China, I would hope that China continues, you know, uh, or, or maybe goes back, whatever, whatever the term is, you know, to being a country on the rise, but a responsible uh, uh, global actor that, you know, abides by things like democracy and, 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 and free markets and non-coercive trade and free trade, right? I think that's what's important to the United States, and that's the kind of rise of not just China, but of, of all countries around the world that, that we should hope to see. Um. Cool. Thank you. Well, building on a previous panel, um, the obvious question, what are the lessons of the Russian conflict in Ukraine, war in Ukraine, and, and Western response to this war for Beijing and also for Taiwan? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, uh, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll start just, you know, if you, if you look back, we talked about the rise, let's mm. talk about the rise briefly of, of China's military, mm. right? And um, I jotted down some statistics. I mean, uh, the PRC has obviously expanded, the, the, the PLA has expanded uh, both of its amphibious capabilities, its, its naval capabilities, right? There's no secret of, of what they're doing in the South China Sea. Um, we're looking at possibly uh, China having 700 uh, nuclear warheads by 2027, uh, 1,000 by 2030, right? Uh, a much more diverse delivery mechanism, tactical all the way up to strategic. So China has been, has been advancing its military. Now, getting back to the Ukraine question, if you look at where that kind of started, a lot of that started after the first Gulf War. And I'm not talking about the second. I'm under the first President Bush, the first Gulf mm -hmm. War, when we expelled Saddam Hussein from Kuwait. That was when the PLA and the CCP, which controls the PLA, remember, they report to the CCP, not to the Chinese government, right, um, looked at that and said, wow, the United States is way, way, way ahead of us in, in military technology and skill. We need to catch up, right? We have been exclusively focused on Taiwan and a couple mm -hmm. of other regional things. We need to become much more of a global player. Um, and so what that tells me about Ukraine and China and Taiwan is that all of these things are obviously connected. And when something happens in one place and mm. sets a precedent, or people perceive it to be a precedent, it, it has very long-lasting implications, I think. And uh, I agree with the last panel. I mean, how we proceed on, and, and what Tom said, I think, is spot on. Ukraine may not be at the top of our priorities just based on trade or strategic location or any of that, but the precedent that is being set there is hugely important both in Europe but also in places like the South China Sea and Taiwan 
and potentially in the Middle East with respect to Iran and Saudi Arabia and other countries. And so I think, um, you know, getting that right and, and not allowing the wrong precedent to be set in the Ukraine and not allowing people to perceive the wrong lesson there is, is going to make a big difference in the, in the future of uh, the South China Sea and, and potentially cross-strait relations. Okay, uh, uh, my, my response is that a lot of people y in the news, in the narrative, talking about today's Ukraine, tomorrow's uh, Taiwan. I think uh, analytically, we might use some kind of, uh, that kind of analogy for analysis, but, but there are all kinds of limitations uh, regarding that kind of analogy. So the correct lesson about Ukraine is not how to fight another war over Taiwan, it's how to avoid another war by all means, for all sides, for the whole world, just for the humanity, I think. The, the, the correct lesson is not to prepare and think about how to fight another war over Taiwan. It's for all sides, including uh, Chinese people, including American people, of course, including people in Taiwan, because, because uh, the correct lesson from Ukraine is to vividly illustrate what the difference between a bad status quo and, and the catastrophe war, right? So, I mean, the status quo of, of, over Taiwan is not comfortable for either side or both all sides, but how to avoid the, the catastrophe? I think that's the correct lesson for both Beijing and Taipei. Any specific measures that you can discuss how, how, to, <laughs> how to preserve peace, right, in the Taiwan Strait? Well, what can the United States do? The United States is essentially, you know, kicking the can down the road, right? Let's, let's just preserve this uh, uh, ambiguity, uh -huh. uh, strategic ambiguity. That's it. That's, what, that's all that I see. Any, any, yeah. Anything more creative than that that uh, you can come up with? I think, yeah, a, a lot of people talking about uh, like the United States uh, policy over Taiwan Street uh, nowadays. Uh, people easily criticize all the weaknesses, problems, but uh, in my opinion, if we think about five or five decades of U.S. policy over Taiwan, it has been pretty much pretty successful it, because because there are huge political differences between. Uh, Beijing and Taipei over their interpretation of the relationship, right? And the U.S. has a big role, and the United States policy has this kind of one-China policy, but also provide some sort of security uh, protection, ambiguous sort of, uh, per, sort of there. So the U.S. has really played a sort of two roles. Uh, on the one hand, U.S deter Beijing from using military force. But on the other hand, the, the effect of deterrence always have the other side of the story. That's called political assurance. So deterrence is not just about, oh, we want to fight. We want to fight. Deterrence always told the other side, if you do that, we will fight. If you don't do that, we will reassure you. So I think the the most important lesson over the five decades is exactly how to balance these two, right? Deterrence and reassurance. So I think that's need a very skillful diplomatic, political messages. Uh, the U.S. need to constantly so do this sort of balance act in, in a very nuanced way, yeah. I mean, miscalculation is obviously a major risk and concern and to the extent we, uh, we could be the U.S. And, and many of our partners and allies. I think to the extent we can help President Xi or Chairman Xi, you know, understand what an utter disaster I think it would be for the PLA to try to forcibly take back Taiwan for the PRC, for China as a whole. I mean, I think it would be an utter disaster for him, for his government, his party, the people of China. Um, and that's not like because we think it's bad. It's not just because we think it's bad. It's because it, it just would be bad. It's, it's like saying, you know, if you don't bring an umbrella and it's raining, you're going to get wet, right? I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to be the one who necessarily gets you wet, but it's going to be bad. And um, 
the risk is, is a miscalculation. And just getting back to, to the original question, I think, mm -hmm. uh, what I see in Ukraine is just the potential for people reading all sorts of messages and lessons into that that, that run contrary to our interests. And it would be a disaster uh, for uh, folks in power in the CCP, I think, in particular in the, in the Chinese Communist Party, to read into Ukraine that that's somehow uh, a, uh, a forcible uh, retaking or a forcible action in Taiwan is somehow more acceptable or less risky now than it was two years ago, because it's not. All right. Thank you. Um, another question which seems to, well, I think we touched upon it um, indirectly already. Uh, in, in the minds of the Chinese leadership, uh, in, in your perception of, of what they think, is China's overall power in international system, is it, is it peaking, meaning it will decline soon, or is it still, you know, on the upward trajectory? Um, relative to the United States. Yeah, Russia. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, uh, objectively and in the minds, you know, so uh, in the minds of Chinese leadership. Yeah, I think uh, nowadays, uh, I mean, the, the, the so called the rise of China discourse has been there for three or even longer time, decades. So, but uh, nowadays, Xi Jinping is often mentioned that. Uh, the term, the rise of the East and the decline of the West, right? So some, but on the other hand, I see in reality is that the United States overall power is not a declining. Is I mean, nowadays the, the the distribution of power increasingly is like from a unipolar system, U.S. is only superpower to a sort of like a bipolar system. The China is rising, but the, there's still a gap between China and the United States, but China and the United States together are more powerful than other countries. I think this is more sort of the, the current distribution of power in the international system. Whether Chinese power is picked or not, I think it's debated nowadays. Uh, China has all kinds, on the one hand, all the problems, demographic, economic challenges, and all the, the, the tension with the United States, with Europe, might also pose a problem for China's economic growth. But on the other hand, the Chinese society are very, is pretty much still very sort of resilient in a sense that economic growth, uh, not like 10%, 7%, but uh, it's still more likely China can maintain like 5 6% you know, GDP growth in the coming years. I, I think that this kind of, uh, sort of China as a declining power, I think it's also a little bit exaggerated, in my opinion. So, but on the other hand, I think Chinese leaders, despite some of their propaganda talking about like the, the decline of the West, they understand the United States is a re resilient power. They, they understand there's still a gap between US and China. And I, I think they, they understand uh, the, the, the West, actually is, is still more powerful, even though China's power is rising. So that's my analysis. Yeah. Uh, you know, a question I have, and, this, and, and I'll ask this of, of, of Pula, sure, the, the, you know, a general, genuine question that I have about mm. Chinese leadership that I don't know is whether they think of themselves first as the PRC's leaders, think of them first as leaders of the PRC or as CCP officials still. So I think that's that's an important distinction. And the CCP obviously plays an enormously mm -hmm. important role. Everyone of consequence in the PRC who holds an office of consequence, almost everyone holds it by virtue of their party position, mm -hmm. not their government position. Do you what do you what do you think about do they Mm. Do, do you think they think of themselves first as CCP officials or as oh, government officials? Uh, yeah, yeah. So what you describe is, I think, the China's uh, the, the Chinese political system. Yeah. In a sense that the Communist Party of China is not a conventional sort of ruling party, like we understand in the Western democracy, right? We, we talk about like a ruling party control the Congress or executive branch, but the Chinese Communist Party of China is sort of a how to say. The, 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 they call leading party, in a sense that they, they lead in all s s sectors. Right. So in a sense that when, what you try to ask, I, I guess, about the foreign policy implications is that when Chinese foreign policy, uh, for Chinese leaders, they make decision 
do they consider prioritize CCP, the party's interest versus the country's interest, right? So I think they have a sort of a hierarchical understanding of national security. Yeah. So their national security sense is, uh, is the number one is regime security. Number two is territory integrity. Number three is about global security. So it, it put in another way, for Chinese leaders, their number one priority is to maintain Communist Party's rule in China. They, they are not trying to, at least at this moment, to rule the whole world. They have neither intention nor capability to do that. I think in their mind, how to maintain Communist Party's rule, that's their top priority. Right. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's like the, old, the old Tip O'Neill expression, <laughs> right, all politics is local. And that's something we, we say, you know, what is China thinking or what uh -huh. is she thinking or what is... You know, you've got to remember the CCP, mm. right? Is a it's a political party. It's very different than the Republican or Democratic Party, mm. but it's still a political party, mm. and the leaders of China are chosen through that political party mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. Which is very different than choosing leaders through a sort of organic political mechanism. Mm. Certainly, in a democracy like the United States, or even in, in more autocratic um, countries, um, and so you know, I think that. We got to keep that in mind uh, when talking about Chinese leadership, because I think, as, mm -hmm. as my colleague said, yeah, they really, I mean, Chinese leaders are going to be concerned first with the stability of the regime, meaning the stability of the CCP, or the monopoly mm -hmm. that the CCP has on power, and their position within the CCP, mm -hmm. and gaining power and currying favor within the political party mm -hmm. that holds all of the power in the PRC, and that's an enormous difference, and it's one that's sometimes lost. I know it's lost on me frequently after I remind myself of it, and many of my other colleagues, and I think many of us when we think of China, and uh, when you think of it through that political lens. I mean, imagine if every time you had an election there was a new president of the United States, the armed forces of the United States took an oath of loyalty to his or her political party, right? It'd be pretty different. It'd be way different, right? I mean, people like to talk mm. about, ah, oh, Trump this or Biden. <laughs> it's like, no, 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 no. It'd be way, way, way different if they had to swear an oath to a political party. But that's exactly what happens mm. in the PRC with, with the People's Liberation Army. My, my last question, and then I'll ask you to, to, uh, you know, to, to make concluding remarks, and we're going to open it to, to the audience. Um, are we ready, uh, United States and China, right? Are, are United States and China kind of prepared for really managing serious crisis. And we just had this um, balloon incident, which was more uh, comical <laughs> than anything else. But, you know, I'm talking about real crises, not, not, not Chinese science, science projects, but, but, you know, something, something real. Um, you know, we mentioned Taiwan. You mentioned East and Southeast China seas and um, China giving, let's imagine, China giving lethal weapons to, to Russia. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but, mm -hmm. but something like this. Are we ready? Because if we're not, um, um, there's a lot of talk about the uh, spiral of escalation, right, occurring between China and the United States. So, so that's, I think that's, that's sort of a big question for the future. Are we prepared to manage the crisis? Uh, I, you know, I, look, Kirk Campbell in January, uh, the, you know, senior, um, China official in the White House, former Assistant Secretary for Asia, he talked about maybe the need to focus on establishing better guardrails with the PRC in 2023. That's something that we haven't heard a lot about um, in all of the talk of the balloons mm -hmm. and this and that, right? But I mean, you know, if you think back in the height of the Cold War, and we are not in another Cold War, I think, hopefully not yet um, or ever. Uh, but at the height of the Cold War, that was one of the achievements of the Cold War before we really got to detente and then to before we got to the strategic arms limitation of those things was establishing those guardrails, establishing that hotline, right? So to really reduce the chance of miscommunication, to reduce the chance of something like a science experiment gone wrong, <laughs> as Alexi put it, um, sparking something uh, that you didn't want or, you know, I mean, there were even talks of, at one point, a meteor entered the atmosphere, and NORAD, for a little while, thought that might be a, a first strike by the Soviet Union. I mean, you want to really, really minimize the chances of that, particularly 
when the PRC is developing, you know, and gonna have 700, you know, nuclear warheads and troops spread out uh, around the world um, uh, and the guardrails are gonna be important. I don't think we're there yet. Yeah, I mean, I really don't think that we have those guardrails in place. I think we're not, and we don't have the muscle memory. I mean, we've lost it since the Cold War because we just haven't been faced with that type of threat of, of really going off a cliff uh, and having those consequences be that dire, right? And uh, without that focus, we've kind of lost the muscle memory of like, hey, what do we do if this thing starts to spiral? Who do we call? Like, does the State Department and DOD- and What if they don't answer? And, yeah, and the White House Situation Room, do they have that book on the shelf? And what if they don't answer? And what if it's a vacation? What if it's Chinese New Year, right? We, you know, all of these things you've got, <laughs> seriously, right? Thanksgiving, like, you gotta think of this stuff. And we're not thinking of it, I don't think. A, a dose of optimism, maybe? Or... Okay, yeah, yeah, I'm optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think uh, before Jack Sullivan and Kurt Campbell joined the Biden administration, they published a very good uh, foreign affairs article they propose the idea of a competitive coexistence. I think that's a very good framework. So the framework try to, uh, try to propose that number one, both Chinese and American society are very resilient. So these two great powers have to find a way to coexist with each other. Number two, the United States will compete with China uh, because the United States would defend American values, American interests, but the United States also need to sort of maintain some kind of peaceful framework to coexist with China. I think the, the overall framework is very good, but unfortunately in practice, there are all kinds of problems. Number one, what's the difference between conflict, uh, competition and conflict, right? So on the one hand, we talk about, okay, try to avoid the conflict, but in, in real competition, sometimes the difference, difference between conflict and competition is very difficult. Number two, I think both countries have all kind of po politics, domestic politics, that will pose the challenges to, to officials, to diplomats. Number three, because of the pandemic, I think uh, in terms of communications, uh, there are a lot enough sort of people to people in-person meetings, even between officials or among diplomats. I think that will limit uh, some of the effective diplomacy. But hopefully, maybe the pandemic is gradually over and there's some kind of uh, real diplomacy will resume. So hopefully, uh, the two sides can have some sort of framework to try to work out some, some framework that will manage all the problems. And by the way, I mean, U.S. China always have all kinds of disputes, problems. Even in the 1990s, people now, nowadays talk about 1990s, U.S. China, all the uh, like uh, very friendly, friendly years. But in those days, there are all kind of diplomatic crises uh, as well. So I think uh, uh, we, we need to be cautious, but not too pessimistic. I would say. Sure. Concluding remarks. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I. What I'll say is this, I mean, not, not specific to the US and the PRC uh, or even the Indo-Pacific. I mean, I think something that I have tried to keep in mind that I've seen in my career as a diplomat, I was an attorney uh, before, um, but something I've certainly seen as a, uh, uh, man, my career as a, as a diplomat is the importance of, of always trying to distinguish between intent and consequence. Mm. Um, right, and we focus a lot of the time on, on what, do, what, do these, what does the other party want to do, right, or what do we want to do? Um, and I saw this on Capitol Hill as well. I think one of the reasons why Chairman Royce uh, was so successful in, in passing so many pieces of bipartisan legislation, advancing things, it's not just this intent of wanting to reach across the aisle or wanting to get mm. the thing done. Uh, what the chairman focused on and, and what good legislators and politicians focus on is, is how do I get it done? What's the consequence? How do I avoid unintended consequences, right? Um, and part of this in the practice of diplomacy, I think, and, and in negotiation, I teach a negotiation course right now, and I saw this as an attorney, as a capital markets attorney, I saw it on Capitol Hill, I've seen it as a diplomat, is, is related to this, the importance of distinguishing between 
your positions and your, and your interests and your counterparty's positions and interests, right? Your position is what you say you want. Your position is, you know, I, 300 fewer nuclear warheads or this, you know, that's your position. I, I want to pay 3,000 a month in rent for this house or whatever, right? Um, your interest is what, what you're really after, right? And that could be intangibles. That could be respect, mm. right? That could be, you know, I learned about Zheng He's, uh, uh, you know, uh, naval fleet, mm. and I read about the opium wars, and we have been disrespected by the world, and we want some of that back, right? That can be an interest, a core interest. The position, it'll manifest as a position in some other way, but understanding that core interest and understanding how to turn the sort of the good intent that hopefully there's some sliver of good intent that we all share out there, right? Just like peaceful world and, you know, maybe not Putin, but, you know, some others. Uh, <laughs> and turning that into consequence is, is quite important. And I'm, to end on an optimistic note, I'm very optimistic that if we get that practice of diplomacy and statecraft right, both domestically and overseas, uh, look, we're in a position to have a remarkably peaceful prosperous world. We, are, we do have a remarkably peaceful, prosperous world. We have a, the ability and I think the potential to expand that for generations in, in an unheard of way in history. So um, I, that's, that's what I hope uh, we can all kind of go out and take away from this and, and do <laughs> in the future. So some, some final thoughts. Uh, uh, I think number one is that for a lot of international political problems, it have all the complicated causes. So sometimes we need to differentiate between ideal goal and more possible reality. Uh, here we have the, uh, President Nixon's uh, library. Remember, when Nixon visited China, he had to make difficult trade-offs between ideal and reality, right? So, so when we think about a lot of problems, it's not necessarily ideal goals uh, could always need to ideal outcome. So sometimes for political leaders, for governments, they have to manage all these challenges. Their choices, as I described earlier, bad, worse, catastrophe. So the, the real goal is how to avoid catastrophe. Number two, I want to emphasize that despite sort of uh, uh, all the political ideological problems worldwide, I think the best way to promote democracy is to make democracy work at home. So especially including for the United States, right? So for US, the whole world, including US allies in the, in the Indo-Pacific region, they see the United States as a country as a whole. So in a sense that democracy promotion is not necessarily about like uh, criticizing Putin or criticize Xi Jinping is also about how to make democracy work at home. That's very important, I think. So in a sense that I, I'm still optimistic about the US because I think even we think about the government sometimes and all the problems, but American society is amazing. So I, th I have lived in the US for 20 years. I, I enjoy my work and my life here. I think in terms of like all the, the society, the civil rights group, universities, private sectors, all fantastic. So in a sense that we don't sort of overestimate this kind of America decline narrative. So we need to think about the US position in the world in a more comprehensive way, so yeah. Great, uh, we're gonna open it to the audience. Yeah, side. we've got some questions here. <clears throat> yes, I have my doubts about um, China PRC, uh, invading Taiwan kinetically, mm -hmm. okay? I have my doubts because they see what's going on in Ukraine, Putin. But will they try to subvert uh, Taiwan cyber warfare, economic, political disinformation? Do you think they will someday? Yeah, well, I mean, there's evidence that that, that certainly is, is possible or maybe, you know, likely or even has happened, right? Um, I, I think that's, that's, that's an arrow in the quiver. Right? If you're the PRC, that is certainly an arrow in the quiver. And, you know, the thing that gets you is, is, is rarely the thing that you were planning on, right? So they, they built the Maginot Line, you know, thinking of World War I, and, and Hitler flew over it because he had these things called airplanes. And he drove around it with his panzer tanks, and, right? So, um, you know, what's our Maginot Line? Well, maybe it's thinking that if you're going to retake 
uh, Taiwan coercively, it would be by, you know, staging an amphibious landing and, and maybe, uh, you know, maybe we ought to be thinking of, of other things. I think the lesson, the takeaway should be the same, that, that either would be disastrous, either would be bad for the people of China, either of those approaches would be bad uh, for the, you know, for the world um, and certainly for the people of Taiwan. And, and I think the United States can be and should be uh, quite clear that, that we would have a real problem with that. So my, my response regarding the Taiwan crisis, I think that there is no doubt Xi Jinping wants to take Taiwan back. That's even in China's PRC's constitution. Right. <laughs> That's their sort of a PRC identity. Right. So, but on the other hand, the real question is when and how? So between the Putin's style occupation of, of war and doing nothing, there are tens of, Xi Jinping has tens of other diplomatic, economic, you, you talk about cyber and all the, so the real issues from between there, between a war, another war, and doing nothing. There are a lot of things Beijing can do. So the, the, the choice is, what I, I want to emphasize from US is not just talk about, um, how to say, deterrence. Deterrence is one of the equations. I still think in terms of political reassurance, diplomacy, even some kind of political dialogue between Beijing and Taipei, that's also very important. Because Taiwan has 100 billion trade plus with mainland China. So in a sense that, on, on, over the Taiwan Strait, their economic, societal uh, relations are very strong. So I think we need to keep the sort of uh, peace and prosperity over Taiwan Strait and including East Asia. I think that's also very important. Oh, thank you. Um, this has just been a fantastic discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to go back to Alexei's question early on about you know, the peaceful rise of China. After 2001, when uh, China entered the WTO, uh, things were moving along well, Every, everything was, was moving smoothly until Xi Jinping st started these aggressive actions. Some of the things that Chairman Royce talked about over lunch in the South China Sea, the uh, aggressiveness uh, against, uh, against countries in the region, this wolf warrior diplomacy that you mentioned. But in response, what, you've, what China has now seen is Japan changing its defense strategy. Mm -hmm. We're seeing this AUKUS, uh, the uh, submarines going around the, the, the area. The US is, is trying to increase troops and basing in the region. We're seeing uh, South Korea thinking about hosting nuclear weapons. So I'm wondering, uh, okay, is, have we seen any response back, counter response back from China to say, whoa, maybe, this, maybe we should have been uh, a little more thoughtful about this, or, or have we seen any response at all? Thank you. One small correction, uh, it started under Hu Jintao. It intensified under, under Xi Jinping, but Hu Jintao uh, is the person associated with the beginning of this, if, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. So, I'm sorry, please. Uh, I think uh, to some degree, uh, in China, I have seen some kind of debates or, or discussion, reflection about, I think, uh, uh, there are different opinions about like China's sort of uh, assertiveness, assertive foreign policy. Uh, some scholars even talking about whether China is a little bit like overreached sort of in, in diplomatically. So there are some sort of reflections. But on the other hand, in international politics, uh, it's pretty natural a, a, a country become more powerful. They want to expand their influence. <clears throat> Uh, regionally and globally. But on the other hand, international politics also talk about balance of power. When, the power. when a country is rapidly rising, there's always counterbalance. So in a sense that to some degree, Japan, South Korea, uh, even Philippines, uh, they want to strengthen their security relationship with the United States. That's natural reaction to China's more assertive uh, 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 role. Uh, but on the other hand, in the long term, I think for the U.S. foreign policy, there is still a question. U.S. long-term goal have two choices. Number one, should the United States maintain primacy in Asia, preventing China to maintain any, any role in the region, or U.S. goal is to maintain balance of power, preventing China from achieving primacy. There's a difference there. I think the second is more achievable. If the United States goal is to totally exclude China in the region. That will, uh, I think, uh, generate 
sort of some sort of uh, counter uh, uh, effective as well. So uh, counterproductive effect uh, as well. So I, I think how U.S. think about uh, the long term regional goal is also very important. Yeah. Uh, with respect to your question of, of mm. whether the the leadership or, or you know there are those in the PRC who, mm. who are rethinking things, I would say how would we know? How would we ever know that? I mean, it's you know. You would know that in the U.S. through the, the presidential debates and through debates in Congress and by watching Fox News and CNN mm -hmm. and MSNBC, right, at, at conferences like this. How would we ever know that if that's going on within the CCP? It might be. It's certainly, I'm sure there are, I mean, CCP is a big organization, right? I'm sure there are people who are having second thoughts or think that uh, Xi's approach is, is not the greatest or maybe has some unintended consequences, but we'd never hear about it. And that's a major weakness I think of the communist system of the CCP's approach, and that is a major uh, risk factor for us. Is that th those voices are not going to be heard until maybe much later? But can I have a? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, as a scholar, uh, I studied. I write a book, articles about the Chinese foreign policy. So I conduct field work in China, interviewed uh, Chinese uh, uh, officials uh, and, and uh, scholars. I think we can empirically actually observe some very nuanced debate in China. In a sense that, of course, Chinese scholars, experts in China's think tank, they cannot openly say, oh, Xi Jinping, President Xi is wrong. But they, they would, <laughs> right, that, that would be too dangerous. But they will, they will actually still write some sort of analytic articles talking about, right. okay, there's a, BRI is right. But the implementation, there's all the problems. So they will not say BRI, the yeah. Belt Road Initiative, by the way, the Xi Jinping's uh, major initiative. The Chinese scholars, they will not say, oh, BRI is wrong, because that means Xi Jinping is wrong. So right. they, they, they will say the implementation of BRI right. has all the problems, generated all right. the backlashes. We can still observe some nuanced uh, debate in China. So yeah. Yeah, no, that's 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 <laughs> definitely true. But but it's never gonna come in the form of like the DeSantis response oh, yeah. you know letter where he's like, I don't think this is a court. I mean that's a very clear statement. That would be dangerous in China. Yeah, you would that would be real dangerous. <laughs> right. You get to say that once and you know Yeah, very briefly two two questions. Number one is the solution to Taiwan. I read a social media post in Chinese saying that what about dropping Chinese passports in Taiwan and give them half a million Chinese dollars for everyone who claim that there's Chinese citizen. How would you react? What would the United States <laughs> react to that? Uh, so that would be a social media proposal yeah. for the China-Taiwan China unification. <laughs> uh, another one is, do you think G2 is possible, given the, the rivalry going on and eventually, is there a possible G2? Because that was proposed by Obama uh, when yeah. he was the president, and China rejected it. Uh, look, on the first question, I mean, shoot, that would be pretty interesting to see. <laughs> Air dropping Chinese passports and cash. I mean, I lived in Taiwan for a year, and there are exceptionally polite, uh, you know, people who live there. I don't know, if you drop cash out of an airplane, you might, you might test that a little bit. Um, no, I mean, all I'll say is, is whatever, the, whatever the proposal is, you know, I think that, again, it gets back to this thing of you don't have to choose one thing or another, but you, we do want you to have a choice. We do want people to have a free choice. Um, and so, you know, there are lots of uh, people from Taiwan who choose to go and move to the mainland and do business there and live there. That's great. That's their choice. If they are doing so freely, that's absolutely their choice. There's cross-strait marriages. There's cross-strait families, right, both from before and after. And so I, I think that's, that's, that's perfectly fine, right, and, and consistent with our values. Um, as far as the G2, I, I, I'm going to dodge that question because, I, you know, I just, frankly, I don't, it's, it's too hard to predict. Um, short answer is, yeah, sure, anything's possible. And look at stuff that we didn't think was possible that's happening now uh, that we didn't think, you know, wasn't even on our radar uh, a few years ago. So, uh, look, I, I mean, look, my, my, my mother is Japanese. Uh, she was born in Tokyo before the war. My father was born in Brooklyn before the war. Um, my mother's house was destroyed in the firebombing of Tokyo. Uh, and as a young woman, she moved to New York to study fashion. 
and married a young guy from Irish guy from Brooklyn and had me and you know so I think that would have been inconceivable if they would even asked her family when their house was in smoldering ruins after American firebombing hey do you think your daughter's going to marry a guy from Brooklyn and live in no probably that was you know inconceivable so certainly not I would say so regard I think regarding Taiwan I think uh, all kind of creative uh, solutions uh, are welcome. I think as, as long as they can maintain, help maintain peace and prosperity. I think for, for average people across the Taiwan Strait, they don't want war. I think that's the minimum uh, uh, common sense, despite sometimes nationalist voices on the social media, especially in mainland China, sometimes uh, sounds very hawkish. But if you ask average people, do the people really want a war? I don't think so. I think uh, it's all not in China's interest, in, in, so in, in nobody's interest. I think uh, the, the key is how to maintain the status quo and maybe wait for in the future when like the two sides have a better condition, they might then have a more creative space to, to resolve their disputes. Regarding G2, I think uh, China, um, in terms of distribution of power, I, I, I mentioned earlier, the, the international system might move to that kind of a two bipolar system, right? US is still the most powerful nation, China is number two. But I don't think the, the G2 is possible because of a lot of reasons. China does not want to be uh, sort of uh, seen as another uh, superpower, that means uh, all kinds of responsibilities, <laughs> right? So China sometimes wants to sh still hide. And uh, uh, I think regional countries, India, Japan, they don't like the idea of G2 because that means they are not important, right? So I think that for all other reasons as well. Okay, yeah, I, mean, I just, just quickly, just quickly on that point. I mean, I remember I, I, I flew into Shanghai once and I took the maglev, right? And it's the fastest maglev train and you know this maglev and you go into Shanghai and it's this gleaming modern city, right? And I had a meeting with um, some, some, like a government uh, uh, think tank and uh, one of the talking points is we are still a developing nation. We're, you know, we're, <laughs> we're just a poor developing nation. We can't be held to the same standards. I'm like, I just rode the fastest train on the planet. My book, right about that. Your city, right? So, yeah. I have to divide everything by 1.4. I have to remind us we're in a lightning round, so it means quick questions and answers, okay? To those of you who do not know me, I was born and raised until the age 16 in Afghanistan. And I am from the same tribe as the Taliban. In fact, in the Helmand province of the Taliban, our family has got over 7,000 acres of land, which is all drugs. Now, Congressman Royce has given me the opportunity to testify in Congress several times, before and after September 11. And in fact, in a congressional club meeting, in which also Honorable Marie Royce was available, Congressman Royce said, if we had listened to Hassan Nouri, September 11 would not have happened. Now, we started the war against the Taliban after September 11. For 20 years, we sacrificed over 2,300 of our military people in Afghanistan. Two trillions of dollars in Afghanistan. Four presidents in, Af in America. And we gave Afghanistan back to the Taliban. Why did we do that? I'll just very quickly say, um, I served in Afghanistan for one year. Uh, I, uh, we lost a colleague there um, shortly after I left. It wasn't a close friend of mine, but it was somebody that I worked with. Um, and of course, thousands of other uh, young men and women. Um, I have tried in my 21 years not to take policy and the consequences of policy personally. I took that very personally. I'll just tell you, watching that last in, in August uh, of last year, I, I took that very personally. I was, I was very upset and I know a lot of my colleagues who were as well. And I think the lesson I took away from it is, is again, this difference between intent and consequence. You can have a well-intentioned policy. You have to carry it out on the ground in a way that's going to work. You have to pay attention to how you carry it out, how you make it happen. 
And as a practitioner of diplomacy in the national security community, you know, I will do my best and I want others to do their best to make sure stuff like that never happens as a result of us not carrying it out diligently on the ground. I'll let others talk to the policy, but that's, that's how I felt about it. Uh, switching gears here just a little bit, uh, addressing the issue of China and Tibet, uh, would you like to comment on the consequences China should suffer for the genocide in Tibet? And secondly, uh, they have said that they're going to choose the next Dalai Lama. The current Dalai Lama is getting a little long in the tooth, and that choice is going to be coming up here rather suddenly. Um, they want to choose him. They have a very unique way of doing it regarding reincarnation. So. Uh, is the PRC going to adopt reincarnation as, as a <laughs> government policy, or uh, what do you think is going to happen there? Uh, you know, that's, a, that's a complicated <laughs> issue. I mean, uh, Tibet is part of PRC, but on the hand, I think US, this is, I, I speak from a scholar, not a, any political perspective, in a sense that Tibet is PRC. I think even US government's position is not a doubt or challenge Tibet is part of PRC. It's, it's challenge how PRC government handles some of the minority issues there. But on the other hand, in, in, even in my class, I openly discuss, like frankly discuss issues of Xinjiang, Tibet in my, in my East Asian politics class. I ask uh, students to, to read a bunch of materials, understand different perspective. It's a, it's a challenge how how different society manage minority tension, minority problem. We might complain or even uh, sort of uh, criticize all these, uh, some of the government policies, but it, it's a challenge for many society, not just China. So in a sense that like how to manage minority region, right? In, in, in many society, it's a, it's a big yeah, challenge, not just for China. Yeah, yeah I mean, just, you know, I mean, uh, look, they want to, the Communist Party wants to choose the next Dalai Lama, good luck. <laughs> right, I mean, you know, in Congress, like, you could have, there are 435 members in the House who, you know, I mean, you could have members on opposite side who have never agreed on a single thing ever in their entire, you know, time in Congress. They'd agree on that one. You know, that's one, you, you did a, if you did a, a, a resolution on that, you'd get 435 co-sponsors pretty quickly. So, um, it, it would be pretty, pretty tone deaf to do it. They might do it anyway, but it, it, it wouldn't work out politically or public perception-wise, for sure. Great uh, panel. Quick uh, question. Uh, given the fact that in 1949, the uh, Chinese Communist Party uh, inaugurated a 100-year plan to become dominant, and they appear to be on a good track, that uh, after our Gulf War, uh, the analysis provided uh, a few years later, the Chinese colonels in unrestricted warfare proposing eight or so different types of warfare, and that now China has launched three types of warfare that are underway right now, psychological, political, and legal. Given the aspect of Sun Tzu, who says, first win the war, then begin fighting, defeat the enemy without fighting the acme of skill, know your enemy, know yourself, is your characterization that this is just a matter of kind of can't we get along, is it necessary maybe to move the needle a little more toward catastrophe since we're over 50 years into that 100-year plan? Or are we, are we fooling ourselves in the face of the fact that they're very good at deceiving and we might need to adjust our education and our politics somewhat to become more aware of what they might be doing and how we might counter it in a more sophisticated way than just hoping we can get along? Can I answer yeah. this? Yeah, please. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think nowadays there are uh, all kinds of books talking about China or CCP has all kinds of genius grad a strategic design to overtake the United States as a global power. I always doubt that kind of narrative or, or, or book because if we assume Chinese Communist Party leaders are so genius, how could they have the family planning policy uh, try to prevent the Chinese family have more than one children 30 years ago? Now they don't have enough babies. They want to have Chinese family to have more babies. If they are genius to planning all this, right. how could they, I mean, so in a sense that I doubt, in a sense that the Chinese government really has this kind of genius plan. Because if you uh, visit China, you might know local community, uh, provincial governments, they have all kinds of struggle. They have all kinds of fragment. The policy process is very fragmented. 
you know Xi Jinping is in Beijing, he's in charge. I think the, the most realistic goal for Xi Jinping is for him to control China or maybe control Beijing. I don't think Xi Jinping can manage the whole world or replace the United States as a global leader. If he want to like uh, uh, broker peace, uh, between Russia and Ukraine, good luck. Uh, uh, but 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 other other than that, I don't think he has a realistic plan to replace the U.S. global leadership. Yeah. Just very quickly, I mean, I, I I I would not. I definitely would not characterize it as as just an effort of trying to get along. And if I did, you know, if I gave that impression, I apologize because I I do not think that's that's the problem set. Um, to the extent that we are talking about a difference in ideology and the Communist Party has a very different ideology than us, this is, that is a zero-sum difference and that is something where, you know, understanding your history, understanding the context, understanding uh, the abuses of, of communism in the 20th century is very, very important um, and, and places like the Nixon Library do that and I think that, that would be very important to achieving peace is understanding these, these differences. One last question here, and then Marie gets the last one. Yeah, um, do you believe that it's in America's interest to form a NATO-style alliance with our Pacific allies? And if so, do you believe we should include Taiwan within it? <laughs> well, um, we have, we, I mean, we have some robust alliances throughout the Indo-Pacific. It's not, we don't have an, a, a NATO-style alliance. Um, we have been treaty allies with, with Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Korea, Thailand, uh, the Philippines um, for, for many years now. Uh, I don't think it's our choice whether or not that turns into a NATO-style alliance. Obviously, these are sovereign nations that, that would, you know, would decide whether or not it's in their own interests to do that. Uh, I do think what's important is you know, an alliance and a partnership of countries that believe in the principles that I was talking about in free choice and free trade, in free navigation of the seas. Um, you know, if you like that brand of toothpaste, you know, uh, partnering uh, with, with us and our partners, I think, is, is a wise move and, and would facilitate, you know, our, our goals. Um, and then your second question is, you know, it's still the policy of the U.S. I mean, the U.S. government, I'm certain you ask anyone, it's still the policy of the U.S. government that the, the one China policy is still intact. And so um, Taiwan being a member of an alliance like that would be inconsistent with that policy uh, right now. Okay. Okay. Um, I just wanted to make a comment because uh, I just would recommend to everybody in this room to Google the word Uyghur, Uyghur camps. Yep. We haven't really talked about that. And uh, Ed talked today about how do people tr treat their own people. Uh, you know, right now we've got millions of people in prisons. It, it's so easy for everybody to look it up and you can see it. Uh, they're Muslims. They're being tortured. The last thing I did before I left the U.S. Department of State, during COVID, which wasn't easy to travel, I met with the ethnic Kazakhs and the Uyghurs in Almaty, Kazakhstan, who have been tortured and also have family members still in the camps. Okay? They also take away their businesses. Um, I had been to Israel around Hanukkah, and I remember, you know, when you go to the museum, you hear about how we started to kind of hear about things happening with the Jews. We kind of knew things were happening, but people really didn't do a whole, uh, you know, a lot about it. And so when I came back to the U.S. Department of State, I, I said to myself, oh my goodness, you know, this is happening now. This is something that I can do. And so we really started really focusing on that, making a task force. So my question to you is, um, why don't we have more traction on this? This is horrific. Um, all you have to do is see the pictures, meet with the people. Um, and and, and I'm, again, it's transparent. This is not all classified. You can see it. So my question is, you, what can we do about this? Um, and I don't think that China is uh, operating in a way that is, uh, you know, um, a, a kind of equivalent to U.S. standards or even the world, so. Not even close on that, yeah. Uh, look, I mean, the, the administration is, has, has, has described it as a crime against humanity. Um, it, it's clear there's, there's all kinds of evidence, as Assistant Secretary Royce points out, uh, of what's going on uh, there. And uh, I think, you know, Look, I'll just speak as a human. I mean, we should care about that as, as people because it's a crime against humanity. 
and we should care about it strategically because I think it is a significant structural weakness uh, within China. I mean, I think doing this to your own people within your borders is a significant destabilizing thing. And that is not in anyone's interest in the world. So even if you did not care about humanity one iota, you would still have an interest in uh, getting this to stop because it ain't going to end well if it, if it continues. So, yeah. so what I want to uh, emphasize is that human rights, I mean, here's a brief story. One of my former mentors, Professor Tom Christensen, he's America's leading expert of international relations and China, and he served in the Bush administration. He told me a story that uh, when he served in the administration, and some people say, oh, China started to criticize America for uh, human rights problem. Professor Christensen responded that, that that's good. That means human rights is a universal concern. In a sense that it's not just America criticize China. It's also we, we need to think about human rights a universal concern. No perfect society, right? So I think I think I really like Professor Christensen's approach in a sense that frame this as a universal concern and also that means we need to have real conversation with China. I mean, Chinese government, of course, they talk about, uh, oh, they sometimes deny that, but they also talk about there's some terrorism, security. I mean, I have former PhD students coming from Xinjiang. He shared his experience in my classroom. He talked about violence, bombing, they're all real. So in a sense, I think US government officials talk to Chinese counterpart. They need to frame this as a universal concern, rather than this is US criticized China. So I think it's first, human rights are universal concern. Terrorism, security is a universal concern. Let's talk how to handle this in a proper way. So I think that's a good start to start the conversation rather than, oh, this is a one way, only America care about, should care about uh, human rights. Chinese don't care about human rights. No, they should emphasize human rights should be universal concern because that's written in U UN Charter, written, right? So I think that's approach. I guess we're officially out of time. <laughs> we are, and so uh, let's, let's give a let's give a hand to the moderator, the panelists. Right. Um, I really appreciate everybody who attended today and attended both panels. Both panels were outstanding. We appreciate our sponsors. Uh, this has been another successful international symposium named after Mr. Royce. Thank you so much, and we'll see you again next year. <laughs>